Well, scripture reading of God's Word today is Matthew 1, 18 through 24. This is how the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph. But before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law, and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quickly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord has said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord has commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. So be it. So did the song remind you of how old you really are? <laughs> See, if you listen to the scripture, you know that Jesus Christ came to save us from the fire. He'll always be with us. There's a fourth man in the fire, period, all the time. We just need to not bend, not bow, and we definitely won't burn. Father in heaven, thank you for your word. Thank you so much. That your word has stood the test of time that we have it so available today. Lord, help us to not take that for granted, but to, to read and devour it, to study it, to tell each other about it, to teach our children and tell the world about the love that you have, that you would give your son to die for our sins, that you want to save, to seek and save those that are lost, that you don't want anyone to perish, but that all men might come to you. We just thank you and praise you. Open our eyes and ears today to hear your word and apply it to our lives. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So I entitled this to save or not to save. And what I mean by that is, and we'll look at Nebuchadnezzar also, is why did Jesus come? He came to save. The testimony that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego gave spoke to everyone that saw it. Now I know Daniel knew what happened. I don't know if he was there and we'll read a little bit through Scripture and see. But Nebuchadnezzar saw it. All the people saw it. And if you remember from Ezekiel, the presence of the Lord was still in the foreign land where they had been exiled to. God is with you no matter what, even when you have to go through the fire. Barry had us sing, talk about all of our praises and everything. But will you praise Him even when the fire is here? Will you do that knowing that He is faithful and true to you, that He gave up His life? to save you, and that He'll never forsake you, never leave you. He's always with you. So that's why I had Merle read the Scripture, to remind us why Jesus came, that it is God dwelling among us, that He came to save those who would choose to, to believe in Him. When we talked last week, we talked about the day of the Lord, and that the day of the Lord talked about the coming of Jesus Christ the first time, and there were prophecies talking about when Jesus Christ would return the second time. And that built upon the pattern that you were seeing in Ezekiel that all these things that were happening, the good and the bad things, were happening because God wanted to make Himself known, that they might know that He was the Lord. Matthew 24, verse 36 to 39, these are the words of Jesus. But about that day or hour no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father, as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. For in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, up to the day that Noah entered the ark. And they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. That is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. If that sounds familiar, I read it last week. 
that there's nothing wrong with eating and drinking and giving in marriage. But there is a problem when those things become your idols and you don't see that Jesus Christ will return. That He has left you to be His hands and feet to this world. That we have a mission. That we have gifts. That we are called to come together. That we're called to teach our children. Not just to live this world. Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they could have fit in with the rest of Babylon and forgot about God. But they didn't. They held firmly to the faith that they had, even in a fallen world that had no faith. There's still those who will follow. And we need each other to sharpen us. Like I said, the story's not about Daniel here. It's about his friends. About his friends having to face the fiery furnace. Maybe that helped Daniel, as we'll read on this week, face the lions in the den. People are watching each one of us looking at the gifts that God has given us to help build them up in the good times and the bad times. Jesus also said these words to His disciples in Matthew 16, verse 24 to 27. Whoever wants to be My disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow Me. You must do that. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will find it. And most non-believers don't even understand that at all. And a lot of Christians don't understand. If you really love your life, if you want to live, especially eternally, then you'll give up this life, the things that you find so dear and so important that become idols in your life, you'll give them up for the things that really matter, to build up treasures in heaven rather than treasures on earth. And it's a thing that you must do. Verse 26, For what good will it be for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? For the Son of Man is going to come in His Father's glory with His angels, and then He will reward each person according to what they have done. Do you understand this? Do you understand your calling as a believer? Think back to the story here with Nebuchadnezzar. And I'm going to add something to the title that we have to save or not to save. Will God save me? What do I need to do? Is my belief genuine? As James says, if my my faith doesn't have the works, and he doesn't believe it's genuine. Do I really, truly believe Will I go through the fire and still bring praise and glory to God? Will I fix my eyes on Jesus and trust in Him? Or will I bow down to serve man because I'm, I fear man instead? We've read all these scriptures up to this point and God is clear. Fear Him, Jesus says, because He is the one that has the authority to throw your soul into hell. Now looking at Nebuchadnezzar, let's, let me ask you this question. As you read on, ponder this question, and I'm not going to answer it for you. <laughs> will King Nebuchadnezzar be in heaven? I mean, he stood for everything that is against God, the Babylonian Empire, the dynasty. But he was someone that God used mightily to bring about his will. He saw this and he made a decree in what Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did not to bow down to other gods. But then he still didn't show the works, did he? But then as you read, spoiler alert, as you read on you'll see that he was made to eat the grass of the field like a wild animal. And then kind of when that happened to him after that, he's kind of like, okay, I get it. I don't know. But see, here's the point. Jesus came to offer salvation to everyone. Sometimes we forget that because we look at that person that is so evil and say, (laughs) they deserve what they get. I deserve what I get also. And my sin, the wages, what I deserve for my sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And I just want us to think, if Nebuchadnezzar can be saved, which he can, (laughs) that gives hope for a rotten scoundrel like me. Jesus also said these words that Matthew recorded. In verse 19, chapter 19, starting in verse 22, When the young man heard this, this is that young rich ruler that said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He had everything and done everything. He was one that should have it. But see, he didn't want to give up the world. Okay? When the young man heard this, he went away sad because he had great wealth. 
Then Jesus said to his disciples, Truly I tell you, it is hard for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. When the disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished and asked, Well, then who can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, and whenever you see that Jesus looked at them, think of him looking at you passionately, intimately saying to you, I love you. And he said, With man it is impossible. This is impossible. You cannot come to God. But with God all things are possible. Peter answered him, We have left everything to follow you. What then will there be for us? Jesus said to them, Truly I tell you, at the renewal of all things, when the Son of Man sits on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on twelve thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or fathers or mother or wife or children or fields for my sake will receive a hundred times as much and will inherit eternal life. The fires and tests and trials that you go through don't mean anything compared to the rewards that you will receive for believing and trusting in Jesus Christ. Verse 30 goes on to say, But many who are first in this world will be last then. And many who are last, who give up their life to follow me, they will become first. I don't know about you, but I want to hold on to those promises. I'll give you one more of Jesus' sayings from Matthew. In Matthew 24, verses 9 through 14. You will be handed over to be persecuted and put to death. You will be hated by all nations because of me. At that time, many will turn away from their faith and will betray and hate each other. And many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. But the one who stands firm to the end, that person will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. The reason that Jesus came was to seek and save the lost. And we have the privilege and opportunity to be a light to the world, the hands and feet of Jesus, to spread this gospel message, this love of Jesus Christ, the love of God that He would give up His Son to save us. And guess what? We're called to suffer also. <laughs> We forget about that because we don't like that part. So what an appropriate time to read about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Because their faith said, just like the song said, our God can save us. We believe our God will save us. But even if He doesn't, I'm not going to bow down to other gods. I'm going to follow the one true God no matter what the cost because I know the consequences, the rewards, are so much greater. If I stand firm in my faith, the victory that I have in Jesus will surpass anything that I can face on this earth. Nebuchadnezzar, if you haven't noticed it, is mentioned over 90 times in the Bible. Could this scoundrel really get saved? <laughs> Only by God is there something like that possible that somebody that's that much of a scoundrel. He's mentioned in 2 Chronicles, 2 Kings, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel. If you haven't got your sheets, get your sheets. There's still some Daniels here. You're going to read some more in Daniel this week. And then there's Haggai, there's Ezra, Nehemiah, and Zechariah. Now you think, wait a minute, Ezra and Nehemiah, they're back way back. Genesis, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, Job. We've already read those. Well, the reason they're coming now is because they're historical books. They tell the history. And we've finished Kings and Chronicles, and now we go into the history books written in and after the Babylonian captivity. That's why you're going backwards. Do you see this? Because, see, the, the Bible's div divided into poetry and history and law. That's why we're reading it through in a chronological to put a little more sense to our minds. Okay, so don't think you're going backwards because you're not in chronological. So let's look at Daniel. If you've got your Bibles, you might want to turn there. I'm going to go through. If you don't, you can follow along. Daniel chapter 1. Daniel called out to be the God, God's servant, his prophet to the people while he's in captivity. He's answering to the king himself, the king of 
Babylon, uh, Babylon. They rule the world. If anyone could be related to a god, it would be King Nebuchadnezzar. And if you would notice from the video and from the story, he thought he was a god. The power went to his head. Even when he had a vision that told him that the only reason he had the power that he had was because God gave it to him, he still said, look who I am. In Daniel chapter 1, it starts this way. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Ju Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord delivered Je Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, along with some of the articles from the temple. These he carried off to the temple of, of his God in Babylonia and put in the treasure house of his God. It seems like to the world that the God of the Bible isn't God of much at all. Now, isn't that what it kind of seems like today? Ah, oh, that Bible is just a historical book. If, if, if God really was, if that was the God that was here today, we wouldn't see all the things that we see today. Where is he? Is he dead? Just because you're living in a foreign land doesn't mean that God's not there and that he doesn't care. Even when his articles are taken away and it looks like other gods are in control, He's still there. He's still in control. He still has a plan. And he's looking and watching and examining for those whose hearts are focused on him. In verse 3, we read, Then the king ordered Aspenaz, chief of his court official, officials, to bring into the king's service some of the Israelites from the royal family and the nobility, young men without any physical defect, handsome, showing aptitude for every kind of learning, well-informed, quick to understand, and qualified to serve in the king's palace. He was to teach them the language and literature of the Babylonians. Now these men, again, could have thought and relied on their own things that they had, their looks and their wisdom. But this is where Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were, okay? The king assigned them a daily amount of food and wine from the king's table. They were trained for three years, and after, after that they were to enter the king's service. Among those who were chosen were some from Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, okay? The chief official gave them new names to Daniel, the name Belteshazzar, sorry I'm stumbling today, to Hananiah, Shadrach, to Mishael, Meshach, and to Azariah, Abednego. Okay, how do you like that, Merle? <laughs> then in verse 8, But Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine, and he asked the chief official for permission not to defile himself that way. We see Daniel's character coming out here. We see it first. But he's not being really tested so much here, is he? He just says, I'm not going to bow down, and can I do this? And if you'll look and see and let me eat this, you can examine for yourself. But he's showing his character. Maybe at this point, his friends are watching him. And the reason I'm telling you this is so you can see that other people are watching your testimony. There is a saying saying the only Bible that some people will ever read is you and I. Okay? There are people watching. I don't know. I don't know what's going on here. But I see it start with Daniel. Then in chapter 2, we get Daniel comes onto the scene. Daniel chapter 2, verse, starting in verse 1. In the second year of his reign, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams. His mind was troubled and he could not sleep. So the king summoned the mag magicians, enchanters, sorcerers, and astrologers to help him to help him what he had to tell him what he had dreamed. When they came in and stood before the king, he said to them, I have had a dream that troubles me, and I know want to know what it means. Nebuchadnezzar called on what he thought he should call on, the gods of this world, the things that have the answers to, to, to life from this world, his gods. Then in verse 9, he says, If you don't tell me the dream, there is only one penalty for you. You have conspired to tell me misleading and wicked things. Now, guess what? That's what the world's going to do to you anyway. They're going to tell you these lies. If you have all this wealth, everything's going to be okay. If you have your health, these things are going to be okay. If you have these children and this gets done and that gets done, you're going to be okay. 
but let your world come crashing down around you, will you still have faith? Will you still be okay? Or will you rely on those gods who were false, who will crumble to pull you through? What a wonderful story here because we see them fixing their eyes on Jesus who they don't even know and He's walking in the fire with them. Hoping the situation will change. So then tell me the dream and I will know that you can interpret it for me. Not just tell me an interpretation and I'm going to go with it. You've got to tell me what I dreamed first. Verse 11, what the king asked is too difficult. No one can reveal to the king except the gods and they do not live among humans. Because see, they had never seen these gods of the Babylonian empire. They worshipped them but they had never seen them. Well, in the beginning when God created man, He walked with Adam. He was there in the presence of the fire and the pillar and the uh, cloud guiding the Egyptians. He provided for them. He has made Himself known. And He expects His children to obey Him and to worship Him. This is new to the people there, but God is revealing Himself to them. See, one reason they're in the foreign land? Even when they disobeyed, God is revealing Himself so that He may be known. In verse 12 of chapter 2, This made the king so angry and furious that he ordered the execution of all the wise men in Babylon. Now that includes Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So the decree was issued to put the wise men to death, and the men were sent to look for Daniel and his friends to put them to death. Not to get help from them, but to put them to death. The first thing that Daniel and his friends encounter is, you're going to die. What have we done? Nothing. You're still going to die. Okay? Verse 14. When Arioch, the commander of the king's guard, had gone out to put to death the wise men of Babylon, Daniel spoke to him with wisdom and tact. Not something that came from him, but words that came to him from God. He asked the king's officers, why did the king issue such a harsh decree? Arioch then explained the matter to Daniel. At this, Daniel went into the king and asked for time. Now notice what Daniel's doing. First he examines the situation. Maybe his faith is strong at this point, maybe it's not. Then he acts. He doesn't just pray if he's praying. He acts on the scene. Okay? At this time, verse 16, Daniel went to the king and asked for time. To the king, the one who proclaimed himself to be God of all the people and has already given an order to kill you. And he comes before him and says, give me some time. <laughs> Pretty bold. So that he might interpret the dream for him. Well, that just stepped up a notch. Not only give me time, but give me time and I'm going to answer you. Something that the other wise men have already said, this is impossible unless God does it for you. Now that's some faith. Okay? Verse 17. Then Daniel returned to his house and explained the matter to his friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. He gathered together with other believers. He had a prayer meeting, didn't he? <laughs> Verse 18, he urged them to plead for mercy from the God of heaven concerning the mystery, not to rely on human things, but to rely on God. So that he and his friends might not be executed with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. Now wait a minute. Now we're looking at mercy, aren't we? Because not only is Daniel trying to save his own skin, he's trying to save his friend's skin, and the other wise men who don't, they're pagans. They don't believe in the God of Israel. Matter of fact, they're competition to me. They're going to stand up against me. But he says, I want to show mercy. Okay? Verse 19. During the night, the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a vision. Then what happened next? Daniel praised the God of heaven. He worshiped. See the pattern there? See the pattern that should be for your life when you face turmoils and, and trouble and distress? See what the pattern for your life should be when you are thanking God and praising Him for all the good things in your life. Then in verse 24, Then Daniel went to Arioch, whom the king had appointed to execute the wise men of Babylon, and said, Do not execute the wise men of Babylon. Take me to the king, and I will interpret his dream for him. 
He acted upon what God had told him to do. Now, he didn't see the burning bush. I always like to look for the burning bush. He just had a dream. I've had a ton of dreams, haven't you? I hate that dream when you're in high school and you wake up or you come to your senses and you're sitting in a chair in your, in your underwear at high school. Ever had that dream? Oh, I don't want that to come true. But he has this dream and says, this is what it is. I don't know how he knew the clarity or if he just put his faith in God. I don't know these things. But he put his faith in God to save himself and to save his friends. Not knowing what the future is going to hold still. Okay. Then in verse 27, Daniel replied, No wise man, enchanter, magician, or diviner can explain to the king the mystery he is asked about. But let's give credit where it goes. Verse 28, But there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries. Now, what is the mystery that we're talking about here? Is it just the dream? Or does it have a much bigger thing? That you were created. You're a created being, created by God, who wants to have a relationship with you. That means my life is not all about me, but it's about how I can relate to that God who gave me life in the first place. What He wants me to do with my life and how I can bring Him glory and honor. There's the mystery. And why would a God even do this? Why would He want a relationship with someone as insignificant as me who has wanted my will over His will for most of my life? And who will continue to do that? But yet He continues to love me and care for me. And don't forget, Daniel's meeting with the one, if you want to say somebody was a God, was the one who looked like they had all the power and all the might, the one that should be feared. But he said, no, it's not you. There is a God that we deserve, that deserves our worship. And it's not you. In verse 36, this was the dream. And now we will interpret to the king. Not Daniel, we, (laughs) me and my God. Your majesty, you are the king of kings. The God of heaven has given you dominion and power and might and glory. That's the only reason you have what you have. In your hands he has placed all the mankind and even the beasts of the fields and the birds of the sky. Wherever they live, he has made you ruler over all of them. He has put you up in a position where, yeah, you you seem like you are a god. And you are the head of gold of this vision that you've seen. You're more glorious than the other, and you're the head of it. Now, I'm hearing here, looking again, but I've seen the whole picture because I've seen God sacrifice His only Son for me, is I'm thinking, wow, God made Nebuchadnezzar this way. What's Nebuchadnezzar seeing? I'm the head of gold. Because in the next chapter, he's going to build a complete statue of gold. Nine feet wide, 90 feet tall. And says, bow down and worship. He didn't hear a thing, did he? Now don't condemn him. Because how many times have we opened up and read this and said, oh yeah, that applies to me, but that doesn't. Yeah, yeah, maybe that one applies to me, but that one doesn't. Okay? All right. I'm just telling you not to point fingers. The king's response, verse 46, King Nebuchadnezzar fell prostrate before Daniel and paid him honor. Well, he got it, but he's giving praise to the wrong guy, isn't he? He's giving praise to Daniel again because he saw Daniel interpret his dream. Hmm. At least he's got the mindset in there which all human beings have. And Paul tells us in, in the beginning of Romans that we all will stand in judgment. There is no excuse. Creation cries out and says there's a God in heaven. And we have a responsibility. Nebuchadnezzar also ordered that an offering and incense be presented to him. Now I've got to be thinking, what is Daniel thinking at this point? Is, it, is he letting this go to his head? Because now he's answered the king's prayers. Is he going to give, or his dream, is he going to humble himself before God or is he going to let himself get prideful? Verse 47, the king said to Daniel, Surely your God is the God of gods and the Lord of kings. Did he hear his own words? And he is a revealer of mysteries. 
For you were able to reveal this mystery. But see, God was revealing so much more to him. He was revealing that the only reason that he was who he was and that he was king and ruler of the world, greatest of all the empires that would come after him even, and it was all because God gave it to him. Isn't that a time when you should thank God? Isn't it a time when we should thank God? And I'm glad you did that this morning. For all these things in our life, because He's there blessing us every single day. The fact that you woke up and could get out of bed and get in your car and had oxygen to breathe, He is blessing you. Then come the trials and suffering, don't they? The end of chapter 2 ends this way in verses 48 and 49. Then the king placed Daniel in a high position and lavished many gifts on him. He made him ruler over the entire province of Babylon and placed him in charge of all of its wise men. Moreover, at Daniel's request, the king appointed Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego administrators over the province of Babylon while Daniel himself remained at the royal court. Isn't that the way it normally goes? Everything looks like it's going so good until the rains pour or the fires burn. Chapter 3. King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold, 60 cubits high and 6 cubits wide, 90 feet tall, 9 feet wide. And he set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. He then summoned the satraps, satraps, prefects, governors, advisors, treasurers, judges, magistrates, and all the other provincial officials to come to the dedication of the image he had set up. So they came. I'm going to go do it that way. <laughs> and assembled for the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up, and they stood before it. Then the, then the herald loudly proclaimed, nations and people of every language... Wait a minute, that's reserved for Jesus, isn't it? At the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. But look what Nebuchadnezzar is doing here. This is what you are commanded to do. And this command comes from him, it didn't come from someone else. As soon as you hear the sound of the horn, flight, zither, lyre, harp, pipe, and all kinds of music, you must fall down and worship the image of gold that Nebuchadnezzar has set up. Really? You had this vision that Daniel answered. You gave tribute to Daniel's God, and you're telling people, I am the complete statue of gold. Worship me. When you know that God is the one who gave you the breath of life. Verse 6, whoever does not fall down in worship will immediately be thrown into a blazing furnace. Reminds me of the words of Joshua when he said, Decide this day what is desirable, whom you will serve. The gods of your ancestors, the gods that seem like you should do in this time and age, or will you worship the Lord God? As for me and my house, we will worship the Lord. What would you do? Would you proclaim the name of Jesus if it cost you a fiery furnace? Tested by fire. Verse 12. But there are some Jews whom you have set up over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who pay no attention to you, your majesty. They neither serve your gods nor worship the image of gold you have set up. Furious with rage, Nebuchadnezzar summoned Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So these men were brought before the king, and Nebuchadnezzar said to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the image of gold I set up? At least he called and let them confess it for himself. But think about it now. Not only are you accountable for your actions, but you've got to say it again to the man. I'm not going to worship, not going to do what you say. Verse 15, Now when you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipe, and all kinds of music, if you are ready to fall down because you've just become before the grace himself, that should have put the fear of God into you, but the wrong God. Okay, If you're ready to fall down and worship the image I made, very good. I'll show you mercy. But see, he can't show you mercy because he's not God. But if you do not worship it, you will be thrown immediately into a blazing furnace. Then what God will be able to rescue you from my hand? 
Remember Nebuchadnezzar? That one that interpreted your dream already and you set them up in these positions because they worship the God of Israel? Verse 16. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to him, King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves. Oh, that's, that's comforting, isn't it? We don't need to defend ourselves to anyone. Jesus Christ defended us on the cross. It was a finished, complete work. If we believe in Him, we are saved from the fires of hell. Nothing that men can do to us matters, and we don't need to defend ourselves. What a relief. What a peace that surpasses all understanding. We don't need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, uh, my page is stuck. The God we serve is able to deliver us from it. And he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. Well, how will that be? What if we get burned up? How will he deliver us from your hand? You can't do anything else to me. All you did is usher me into the kingdom of heaven. I win. Verse 18. But even if he does not, we want you to know your majesty. Woo! We want you to know this. This is what the whole purpose is. To proclaim God and make him known to the world. That we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold that you have set up. Set up. Now you know the rest of the story. Nebuchadnezzar got furious. He heated the furnace up so hot that the guards who tried to put them in, they got burned alive. And you saw from the video, there was a fourth man standing in the fire. They came out not only unburned, but they didn't even have the smell of smoke on them. Now that's good. We can concentrate on that and say that God will carry us through all these trials and tribulations. And that's how this story is. But I can give you plenty of other stories where that's not the case. That the fire did consume them. I can tell you 12 men right off. I'm not talking about Judas as one. I'm talking about Paul as the 12th one. That gave up their life for the gospel message, literally. They were run through with a, sp with a spear or sword. They were beheaded. They were boiled alive, whatever the consequences were. They were crucified because they would not back down on their faith because they fixed their eyes on Jesus and didn't worry what man could do to them because they knew they had walked with God Himself, Emmanuel, Christ, God with us. And they had said, the things of this world can't do me any harm. They don't mean anything. I'll give it all up. Jesus said, come and follow after me and I will make you fishers of men. And they took that the way Jesus intended it to be. Reading a little more from Daniel, verse 24, King Nebuchadnezzar leaped to his feet in amazement and asked his advisors, weren't there three men that we tied up and threw into the fire? So now Nebuchadnezzar is telling his other officials, who are going to tell everybody, this is going to be the news in the town, we threw three guys in the fire and here they are, and there was a fourth one. Who is this fourth one that was walking in there with them? They replied, yes, certainly your majesty. Majesty, He said, look, I see four men walking around in the fire. They're unbound and unharmed, and the fourth one looks like the son, a son of the gods or the son of God. Maybe you think it was an angel. Maybe it was. Maybe it was an, a Jesus, an image of Jesus. I don't know. All I know was God walked through them with the fire, and I like to think that it was Jesus himself. That's, just, that's mine, but you can go wherever you want to with it. Verse 26, Nebuchadnezzar then approached the opening of the blazing furnace and shouted, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, recognized who they were. He didn't say at all, you didn't listen to me. He recognized that they were servants of the Most High God. Come out, come here. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the fire, and the satraps, prefects, governors, and royal advisors crowded around them. They saw that the fire had not harmed their bodies, nor was a hair on their head singed. Their robes were not scorched, and there was no smell of fire on them. Can you see them all gathering around? What in the world's going on? You don't even smell like smoke. Where, there's got to be something burnt somewhere. Nothing. Because God walked through the fire with them. 
Verse 28, Then Nebuchadnezzar said, the one who set himself up as God, Praise be to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and rescued his servants. They trusted in him, they defiled the king's command, and were willing to give up their lives rather than serve or worship any god except their own. Man, what a testimony. And it's great that God saved them through the fire, but remember what they said first, even if he doesn't, we will not bow down. Verse 29, Therefore I decree that the people of, people of any nation or any language who say anything against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be cut into pieces and their houses be burned into piles of rubble, for no other God can save in this way. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. Good story, good ending. Read on. <laughs> Read on to what happens to Daniel with the next king. Read on that this is not the end of one man confronting Nebuchadnezzar, whether he's going to do his will and his way or if he's going to do God's way. That's the next chapter. I told you a spoiler alert. So I'm back to the question then. What is Jesus' purpose? Is it to save or not to save? Why would God send his only son to die if it wasn't to save even Nebuchadnezzar? And if he has given up his life to save one, some, someone as insignificant as me, then how much more can I give him glory and honor with my life? That he would give up his son's life, who gave up heaven to come down and die for someone as insignificant as me. What else do I have but to give my life back as a willing sacrifice for him? What Scripture tells me is it is pleasing to him and is my proper act of worship. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego's faith probably, as iron sharpens iron, sharpened Daniel for what he would face next. Their testimony, not only their words, but their actions spoke to a pagan empire who was caught up in the things of the world. We say today, what difference can we make in this country? It's too far gone. Everybody worships everything else under the sun. We're still called, and God can do mighty, wonderful things through His people. But first we've got to humble ourselves, pray, seek His face, turn from our wicked ways, right? And stand firm in our faith. Faith that requires actions, even when it means that we're called to walk through the fire. Because Jesus will be there. He will never forsake us, never leave us. And the rewards that come afterwards are so much greater than being appointed as officials in this world. They are, as I read earlier, that, that we'll be given back a hundred times and then eternal life with God. As you read on, contemplate what you think about Nebuchadnezzar. Talk it over. I'd love to hear what you think. It still takes a little bit more to get him to at least come to the light. But keep reading. Keep each other focused. Are you reading? Are you caught up? Thank you for you guys who have been faithful in doing those things because Scripture says again that those who are faithful with a small amount that God will give even more. Father in heaven, we thank you and praise you for the example we have, for these Bible stories that, that we should tell our children. And, and we should look at the things and see the things that the stories tell us. And we read, read Scripture here and see that Daniel wasn't even mentioned there. But yet the videos show that and the stories show that. But we know that, that Daniel was watching his friends, watching his, the testimony of them, as was the whole world. Lord, let us know that people are watching us and that we are called to be a light to this world. Lord, let, us, let our light shine boldly so we may bring glory and honor and, and bring people to the recognition that there is a God in heaven who loves them and gave their, His Son to die for them, that they might be brought back into a right relationship with Him. Father, thank You for this group of people, this church, this hands and feet of Jesus Christ. May we spur one another on to good works. We thank You and praise You this day, for it is the day that You have created. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You got a video first?
you get a sneak peek at one you're reading this week. The book of the prophet Haggai. It's one of the smaller prophetic books, but crucially important in the overall story of the Hebrew Bible. So for centuries,